Well, thank you very much to the organizing committee for uh, inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, I did shorten my title up just a little bit. It, it's supposed to mean the same thing, but predicting chemical exposure pathways. Um, but uh, I am, yeah, as was pointed out, a, a civil servant from a, a regulatory agency, so I am required to say that I'm speaking to you as a scientist, and none of you should write down what I say and say that the EPA told you that. I'm telling you that for what that's worth, which is... Eh. <laughs> So uh, I am also up from uh, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, like my uh, colleagues at uh, the NIHS who showed you the nice picture of their building on the lake. They had the great view up until the EPA built this building right here in the middle of their view. So NIHS is over here. We're the camp on the other side of the lake. Um, there were, part of, were only one facility of 13 in the Office of Research and Development. It's actually a, a fairly substantial arm of the EPA. Uh, we published uh, over 500 papers in uh, 2018, and uh, it's not just federal researchers. I work with graduate students. Uh, I work with uh, postdocs. We have actually uniformed members of the Public Health Service and tons and tons of contractors, so it's a large organization. Um, kind of wanted to add in, you know, the disqualifier, just like I'm not officially speaking on behalf of the EPA, I also don't work in artificial intelligence. I use machine learning. I'd love to be able to say that I do artificial intelligence, but I, I am a user of, of machine learning tools to basically fill data gaps and uh, try to draw inferences from complex data. And I don't think that's very different from everyone else. I just wanted to make that statement. So um, Dr. Klein's story earlier, uh, basically introduced the idea that, you know, we have lots and lots of chemicals. I mean, that's kind of why we're here, but we don't have enough data about them. So I really like this cover from a New Scientist. Uh, it was a couple years back, but it's, uh, and, and you can quibble on the exact number, but we've made tens of thousands of chemicals. So we have a bright red shirt, uh, uh, stick of lipstick, and an apple. You know, we touch them, we wear them, we eat them, but uh, which one should we worry about? And you may be sitting there reasonably wondering why someone from the EPA is here talking about this. Well, it turns out it's our problem, uh, more or less. <laughs> so uh, there's a study down at Emory back in 2012 looking at pooled blood samples. And yeah, they find lots of blood in blood, but there was evidence for hundreds to thousands of uh, exogenous chemicals in there. Now, some of those could have been hamburgers or aspirin. Uh, and there is no single chemi chemicals law in the United States. It's really a tapestry of different laws. And so if, it, if you have a chemical that's a drug active, you have to prove it works and you have to do clinical trials. If you have a food additive, you have to do some effort to make sure that that drug is actually, or that chemical is, is safe, um, unless it's generally recognized as safe. If it's a pesticide and it's designed to kill something, you definitely have to convince the Office of Pesticides at EPA that it's not going to kill the people who end up eating the food. Everything else falls under a law known as the Toxic Substances Control Act. And that, that's basically uh, kind of like a, a, a U.S. law sort of thing of you're innocent until proven guilty. And so, you know, when you saw that list of 150,000 chemicals or whatever, those are EPA's problems and we need to figure out which ones to worry about. So uh, fortunately, the National Academies had a document on this just, uh, just a little while back, January 2017. And they, base, they recognized that the, the computational exposure science, which is what this whole session is about to, uh, this afternoon, uh, could provide a context, or a reasonable context, for the sorts of high-throughput screening data that you saw described from the TOX21, TOXCAST, and other screening projects. And, and the idea is something like this. This is what we call the Pinocchio plot. If you see noses, uh, these are meant to be probability distributions. But the basic idea is that as we've discussed, you might be able to predict LD50 with in vitro data, but you're not going to get the exact MIGs per kg per day correct. And it's maybe not important to. If you can get the uncertainty quantified, if I know for a fact that it's five plus or minus some fixed number that is the MIGs per kg per day, then I have a distribution. If I know the exposure, again, not necessarily precisely, but for the random chemical, if I have the exposure in some ballpark, and there's no overlap between the two, that, is, that fails what I call the grad student test which basically means if I spent my whole career or my grad student career studying this chemical, it's probably not relevant. Whereas over here, there's some chance. So the predictors we have are imperfect, and that's the world we live in. Our, no predictor for an arbitrary chemical is going to be perfect. But if they overlap, then that's suddenly a chemical we worry about. And this goes back to the NRC back in 1983 that said you had to consider hazard, dose response, and exposure to understand risk. 
So what do we know about exposure? Well, I really appreciate getting to go uh, after all the other speakers today because they've done a wonderful job of introducing resources like NHANES, which is publicly available, conducted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and includes chemical analysis of blood and urine in a cohort of, uh, uh, that's updated every two years of the American population, so that we have some idea of what chemicals are in people. Now, as was mentioned, and in any one group, they actually divide the cohort up into three groups because there's only so much blood and urine you can extract from a person without them getting really angry with you. And so they look for about 30 analytes per cohort. So as, I, uh, as was introduced earlier, I think if you, if you think there's 30, cohort, or 30 analytes and you've got you know, all these possible mixtures to consider, you know, I, I think it was Dr. Lichtenfeld said something like, you know, that's two to the 30 is like a billion combinations, right? What are we gonna do about that? How are we gonna test mixtures? And, and we're kind of stuck. But this gets to the point of why machine learning might actually work for environmental health science. So uh, a researcher at EPA, Dustin Capron, uh, working with uh, Mike Trenero uh, at EPA, applied an algorithm, and this doesn't have any sort of fancy conceptual organization like uh, like uh, the or origin, like we were discussing earlier today. This is, literally came out of grocery store algorithmics, and this is now. And it might seem obvious, but this is how they know to put, you know, tortilla chips and salsa in the same aisle. It's called frequent item set mining. And you look at a transaction, and humorously, the very first analyst, uh, analysis of this back in the early '90s came up with the idea that if you're late at night and you're shopping in the grocery store. If you buy diapers, it's very likely that you're also buying a six-pack of beer. Now, I've yet to be to a grocery store that actually has acted on that information, but that's the idea. That transaction, if I'm up and getting the diapers, I'm, I'm drinking. That, that's basically what they're saying here. And so what, we, what um, Dr. Capron did is basically look at the blood samples, so 30 analytes, and then, so here's the analytes across here, and he identified mixtures. Now, some of these are trivial mixtures, like two metabolites of the exact same, um, exact same phthalate. Okay, well, you got exposed to that phthalate. But some of these others are fairly complicated mixtures. And what's interesting over here is you see these numbers that start at 0.33 and go up to 0.4. That's the percent of the U.S. population that these mixtures occur in. So what I'm giving you here is, yes, there's a billion possible mixtures you could build out of these chemicals, but there's 29 you could test here, and each of those 29 is in at least a third of the people in the U.S. population. So if I have tox gas, this is 30 chemicals. That's nothing for tox, tox 21 to test. And that, then you're speaking to a large fraction of the population. Now, why does this happen? We know mixtures is a problem. How can we get away with this? Well, this is what I think of as like the, the, the Coke versus Pepsi test. So I'm a Coke drinker. I really like Coke. Uh, if, I, if I'm in a restaurant and I ask for a Coke and they say, oh, we, we only have Pepsi products. Do you mind? I say water. I, I don't like Pepsi. And that's what you're seeing here is there's structure. You, there might be a dozen different pesticides that kill ants, but unless you have some sort of patholo pathological war against ants, you buy one, and that's your ant killer. You don't combine every pesticide that kills ants, you have one. And so th that's the structure that you're starting to see there. Okay, well, oh, just back, back real quick. Nope, can't go back. There's no, oh, there we go. All right, so there's structure. And that structure is basically the product of human choices and the interesting things that we as people do. And that's kind of what makes exposure fun, because you're predicting human behavior to some extent. So what else do we know about exposure? So we have NHANES. There are actually a litany of exposure models. And a nice paper by um, uh, 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 McLeod, at, McLeod et al. back in 2010, we're basically talking about every model that explains the world is really a collection of a hypothesis about how the world works but also an assumption of what data matter, uh, how are you gonna test your model, and then an assumption of what actually is a good model when you look at the data that you assumed is relevant to your hypothesis that you assumed is relevant. So all these models are different. And uh, there's, you know, George Box is famous for saying um, all models are wrong and some are useful, but really what he was getting at there is that you know, it would be remarkable if there was a perfect model. If there was a perfect model, you have the theory of everything. So of course all models are wrong, but if they're clever, and they simplify a problem. They actually give you information that you don't have. All right. So at the uh, EPA, I, I co-lead what's known as the ExpoCast project for exposure forecasting. We're the sister project to ToxCast for toxicity forecasting. And we have uh, developed a framework that we call the systematic empirical evaluation of models, which is a, a 
government acronym to say we draw a line through it. So I was thrilled that the previous two speakers were, were, were singing the phrases of regression modeling. So basically what we do is we take a data set where we have some sort of monitoring data and we treat that as truth and then we draw a line through it. We take every available predictor, every available model that can try to predict something and we hope we see something. When we first did this, this line was flat. The models predicted nothing. And through time, looking at these different chemicals, we've started to get models that predict things and an empirical estimate of uncertainty, which we can then apply both that calibration, that uncertainty to chemicals where we don't have information. Now, Dr. Kleinstar also mentioned the value of consensus modeling, and I cannot overstate how important it is to look at consensus modeling. And as an example, let's go to the National Weather Service. So this is an actual hurricane that devastated the uh, Caribbean, and you know, th these were the projections. Now, if the National Weather Service had the hurricane model, they would just show you a single line. But they don't have that model. The reality is more complicated, even than the best model. And so instead, they show you a series. These could even be runs of the same model. It's probably an ensemble of models and an ensemble of conditions and parameters in that model. And they show you the range. And the big takeaway is, yes, there's a central tendency. I, I hope I'm not in Florida. But there's a, there's a window here of uncertainty that goes all the way from Louisiana to Maine. And that is being accurate. And that's that confidence interval I was talking about. If I am lucky enough to be up in you know, Nova Scotia or something like that. I'm not worried about this hurricane. But everyone else has to still keep an eye out. OK, so you draw a line through things. Uh, just a fancy linear regression. We called this the, the heuristics of exposure. The graduate student at the time working on this, uh, Amber Wong, came to me and was pretty depressed. We were, we were looking at different cohorts of the CDC NHANES data. And we were trying to make our prediction of what's going to make a chemical higher than average, what's going to make it lower. She got the exact same regression coefficients for every single subpopulation. And so she was really depressed. She came in my office and we kind of sat there for a little while and it's like, wow, that sucks. Then we're sitting there and thinking, wait a minute, you're saying the same five factors predict exposure for everybody in the United States? That, that's kind of cool. So that's, that's where we just started to get excited with the heuristics of exposure. Four of these things are yes or no questions. Is the chemical an industrial chemical with consumer use or no consumer use? What, the only thing that's quantitative is the national production volume. We were able, with this model, to actually explain a lot of the variance that in the exposures that you get from the CDC. So again, why the heck does this work? And I got asked that question a lot, and I worried about it. There's a nice paper that came out, uh, Environmental Science and Technology, I think this was 2015, uh, Hyung Mu Shin, who's now at uh, University of Texas, Arlington, uh, wrote this. And what they tried to do is kind of consensus modeling of human exposure to chemicals. And, and they came up with a model that was ridiculously conservative. Because basically, they had to assume that you used every chemical in every way. And that, that, that doesn't really make sense. So you basically, they said the assumption that 100% of the chemical was used in every single way that they had to do really limited their ability to model an arbitrary chemical. Reasonable. So I'm still a big believer in, consen in, in consensus modeling. So uh, we put together at EPA a collaboration across the United States and actually uh, members in Canada and Europe of models that can basically take chemical structure and make a prediction for thousands of chemicals. Now, are these predictions good or bad? We don't know. The interesting thing, well, there's lots of interesting things about this, but I've only got a little bit of time. These are different sorts of models. Some of them are, are residential, some of them are dietary, some of them are chemicals being poured into water from a factory. Some of them are literally just, is it a chemical that's been banned by the Stockholm Convention? There are models for all sorts of scales of things. I, I, I like to draw the, the comparison to um, model trains. You know, I've never had a model train myself, but if you, if you told me to build a model train set, you know, I'd get up some green paper and I'd put the train tracks and I might put some trees in. That's kind of my, my idea, my mental model of what a model train set's like. Very few people in this room, I think, I hope, would start making teeny tiny sandwiches for the dining car. But that is a factor you could include in your model train, right? You could stock that dining car and say, it's important to me that that dining car be stocked. That's the sort of assumptions we're talking about. EPA literally has a model for the application of pesticides to mattresses. Now, that's a, probably a killer model for applying pesticides to mattresses, but it makes no sense to run that for every chemical that's out there. So we started to group things by pathways. That those yes or no questions, those heuristics, basically are, 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 are questions of, is it a consumer chemical? Is it a dietary chemical? Is it just a pesticide? Is it an industrial chemical, or do we not know? And you can lump all those models together by pathways. 
So I've got five minutes left, and I, and I sit in here, and I have yet to tell you about anything about machine learning. <laughs> but I expected that. This is, this is the sort of thing that we don't know for the chemicals, the 150,000 chemicals that new scientists are worried about. We don't know. Do you touch them? Do you eat them? Do you wear them? We just don't know that yet. This is where we use machine learning. So, as everyone else has mentioned, if you have well-curated data sets, the machine learning part is actually straightforward. And that's, I think, what the exercise this, the rest of this afternoon will show you, is that we had examples of positive chemicals of, you know, the FDA has a list of your daily estimates of intake of chemicals, thousands of chemicals to train from. We had uh, pesticides. EPA knows a lot about pesticides. EPA has actually led a, a big effort to build a consumer product chemicals database that's publicly available. And then we do have industrial chemicals. Uh, the Norman scanning in Europe, uh, USGS monitors chemicals that occur in water. It's actually really easy to get lists of positive for these categories. It was a lot harder to say this chemical is never in drinking water. Uh, for, for the we defaulted to mostly relying on chemicals that were known to be pharmaceuticals, although I actually have my doubts about that for Farfield Industrial. There is known exposure to, you know, we all take, well, we don't all, I take a lot of Tylenol, and I excrete Tylenol into the drinking, into the drinking water supply, and hopefully the plant cleans it up, but maybe not. So anyhow, we built all these models, and we actually get decent balanced accuracies. We're going straight from chemical structure to how the chemical is used. That might seem crazy, but on the other hand, there's certain features you, know, you have to have to be a solvent. You can't just be a chemical. If we do that, now we're looking at the intake rate from the CDC for uh, 120 chemicals. We end up explaining about 80% of the chemical to chemical variance for the average person using all those models and machine learning to predict how the chemical is used. And we can now take that information and apply it. EPA has a database of 687,000 structures that we're interested in. And we can look at them and we actually can make exposure. Now, about 30% of them don't match any of those pathways. And that's OK, because again, like Dr. Lichtefeld said, you, you don't, you, you don't want to extrapolate from 120 chemicals to 680,000 chemicals, right? That, that would seem like a poor thing to do, except that for 70% of these chemicals, we have, and this is probably why EPA was interested in them in the first place, evidence that they are an industrial chemical, or they're a consumer product chemical, or they're both. And we can tell that with our machine learning model. OK, so if we have that information, then these can be estimates of exposure that are really uncertain. So these are actual chemicals from the CDC, estimates of exposure. This is, and I'm sorry the ones are cropped here, but every tick mark here is 10,000 fold change. So like this estimate for whatever chemical it is here is god awful. We only know it to, I don't know, within plus or minus a thousandfold. You know, that, and I was actually asked this by one of my bosses at one point, what am I supposed to do with an exposure prediction that's uncertain to like a million times? And this is what you're supposed to do with it. It's the grad student test. This is Toxcast bioactivity that's been converted to a dose in bigs per keg per day. This is the exposure. Both of these are uncertain, but they're separated by a hundred million times. So that means I could be wrong a couple of times, and there's still not going to be an overlap. On the other hand, there's some chemicals here where, again, this is screening level. This isn't proof. But I'd be much more interested to know about these two chemicals here where there's a possibility that the exposure and the toxicity actually overlap. So that's how you use the ExpoCast and the ToxCast together to do a relatively rapid screening. All right, so I've got just a little bit of time left. I want to tell you about one other thing. If I can go from chemical structure and predict the chemical pathway, I can predict how the chemical is used. Now, I actually can't do this. Catherine Phillips who did, <laughs> could do this at EPA. She was able to, again, with a properly curated database that we call FUSE, the functional use database that maps chemical structure to how it's used. So we have things like it's used as a UV absorber, it's used as a preservative, it's used as a hair dye. She, everyone that, every use here, that's here in green, she was able to build a machine learning classifier with random forest that actually predicted accurately the, the use. Now, some things she couldn't build a model for, like a viscosity controlling agent. She had a data set, she couldn't build it. Why is that? Well, you can have a thickener and you can have a thinner. Our data set was only curated to it does one or the other. I'm guessing that those chemical structures are opposite of each other. And so, again, if you curated that data further, then you could build your model. What you can do with this, though, is take the TOX21 data, which shows you the bioactivity. You can look at all these uses. And you can start to look at the probability. So here we have all the TOX21 chemicals that we don't even know how they're used. I'm not even sure how they got on the TOX21 list. 
but we know that they're more or less bioactive than other chemicals that have the same function. So let's look at, uh, at colorant here. We have high probability that these chemicals are colorant, and then we can actually examine whether or not any of these predicted colorants are actually less bioactive than actual colorants that are in use today. So this is green chemistry by machine learning. This is a nice paper that, uh, in green chemistry that, uh, that Catherine Phillip published. So just to wrap up, at the EPA, we, we are us we're users and users of algorithms. We're not developing new ones, but we really need to do this. This is a major problem in that we need to come up with some sort of action for thousands of chemicals. And what we're able to do is basically, it's, it, we're, you know, I, I went from, we, we, I asked earlier today, how do you get from empirical to mechanistic models? Well, I've taken a bunch of mechanistic models and turned them into an empirical model, so I'm, I'm a real jerk. But, uh, <laughs> but that's what we're doing. That's the trick to figure out how to use them. And basically, what we're able to do is get estimates of uncertainty, and that's the key to making a decision. Now, I need to thank a huge, huge team across EPA as well as lots of external collaborators. I get to do the fun part and show you the cool graph from a half dozen papers. These are the people who did all the work, especially my co-lead, uh, Kristen Isaacs, who co-leads the ExpoCast project with me. Thank you.